Listen to the 48 Hours podcast for shocking murder cases and compelling real-life dramas from one of television's most watched true crime shows. Go behind the scenes of each episode with award-winning CBS News correspondents and producers in Postmortem, a weekly deep dive. Listen to 48 Hours wherever you get your podcasts. Hey everybody, it's Kelly Wilkness. I'm here with Anita Joyce and this is Decorating Tips and Tricks, episode 421. Today I am talking with Stephanie Rose of Garden Therapy. We're having a very special garden chat and Stephanie's going to give us some wonderful tips and tell us all about how her life led her to her passion for gardening. Stephanie's the founder of the popular site Garden Therapy and the author of several wonderful books. I am so delighted to introduce you to Stephanie Rose. And we're going to be dishing the dirt, or should I say the soil today, all about gardening and about Stephanie's journey to her gardening passion. So Stephanie, welcome to Decorating Tips and Tricks. Thanks, Kelly. It's so nice to chat with you. Why don't we start by telling everybody how you became so passionate about gardening? (laughs) Um, Okay, yeah. Well, I started gardening. It was out of necessity. I wasn't really a gardener. I bought a home in Vancouver, BC on, you know, like a little, my first home in a standard city sized lot and, you know, spent a lot of time decorating the inside and just sort of left. There was, you know, a square lawn in the front and a square lawn in the back and a couple of shrubs and sort of left it. And then all of a sudden in one day in 2006, I got a headache and that headache turned into a pretty severe disability. I was, I became suddenly ill. I wasn't able to work for almost 10 years. And I wasn't able to even get out of bed for the first couple of years. I had intermittent paralysis in my arms, my legs, I had some neuropathy, lots of pain, I could barely do anything. And so I was stuck at home by myself, healing, um, you know, not feeling so great. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go outside and garden. And that's how I'm going to heal myself. Stephanie, let me let me jump in here for a minute because everyone's <laughs> jaw probably just dropped when you told me that story. So, did, did through doctors or your own research, did you ever determine what was going on with you? No, I mean that's yeah. Part of it is I had to do a lot of work on accepting the fact that I just will never probably know. They said it could have been an, um, an insect-borne illness, a form of chemical poisoning. It could have been a virus. They're not really sure what it was that got me, but it started with a headache. And within a few days of the headache, I mean, I was not able to get out of bed and my whole system just shut down. So it, it was a really long recovery process. But that first couple of years, I could not get out of bed. I didn't, I didn't, I, I would get up and I would just like, I would take a shower and brush my hair. And that's all I could do. Like in a week, it was, oh I was goodness. so exhausted. So yeah, it was a real, it was a very challenging time. Um, but I'm a very positive person. And so I, it was, it was hard. Like I cried a lot, believe me. And, and, you know, I missed my life, but at the same time, I looked at what I had and I was so grateful for what I had, which was this, you know, little home with this little yard. And I thought, this is, this is what's, I'm going to change here. I'm going to, I'm going to build up my strength here. So I started with just five minutes a week. I got all the books that I could find at the library on gardening because I had no experience with it. I grew up in the city. I didn't garden. And I got every book in the library and gardening and I sat in bed and I read them. And then I went outside and I practiced a little bit at a time. And I've actually, I'm going to be putting it up in a couple of days. I show the transformation of my garden over five years. I put up a picture on Instagram because I talk about this story and then people are like, but what does it look like? And the transformation of this sort of (laughs) dust bowl of dirt, which my yard was, which turned into this really tropical lush and full space. Um, really shows not just the transformation of my yard, but how I was able to heal and how I was able to change and grow and strengthen myself as a person. What an amazing, amazing story. What made you think that gardening would help you heal? Well, it's so funny because it's it's pretty much what people are going through right now. People are turning to gardens because they're stuck at home, um, because we're sheltering in place, because we're trying to stay safe, but we're also focusing on 
our health and well-being. And what's more nurturing than working on plants, being outside in the fresh air, breathing in the soil, you know, including beautiful flowers or fresh food to nourish your body. I really went back to basics. I didn't know what it was that caused me to be sick. I mean, I spent a lot. We've got great health care here in Canada. I, you know, went to every doctor and specialist, traditional, non-traditional, and really the answers came from me working with plants. I was able to heal myself through spending time outdoors, changing my life, changing the food that went into my body. And as you know, changing the products that I put on my body, so my skincare. Um, you and I have talked before because I know you have a copy of my home apothecary book. And oh, you- a dog-eared <laughs> copy of that. We made every single one of your recipes and Aww. your beautiful products. Yeah. So I, I mean, what's, what's funny is that people are so concerned with what goes into their bodies. It's great. I'm really happy that people, you know, want to make sure that their, their food is organic and fresh and that what they're putting in is nourishing them. But what we put on our skin is also so important. There's so many, uh, lab created additives that are added into our lotions and soaps and shampoos that yes, in a lab, they're tested to be safe and we can process them through our bodies, but they our bodies still have to do all this work to get the stuff that's not supposed to be in there out. Our organs are filtering out these chemicals. And if we don't put those chemicals in our body, instead we're putting in natural elements that feed and nourish our skin, then we're not only having to work extra hard to get rid of it, but we're also letting the skin, repairing the skin and bringing it to where it's supposed to be in the first place, bringing it to its ultimate health. So I also believe in growing a garden. I grow a skincare garden. I grow all these, you know, common herbs like lavender and chamomile and mint and rosemary that you can use to make your own skincare products and it's so much easier than it's so much easier (laughs) than people think it is it seems so daunting to make soap and lotion but really it's actually quite easy like compost it is much easier than people think but let me take you back for a second so how long did it take from taking all those books out of the library and reading them and then going out five minutes a day maybe 10 minutes then up to an hour and whatnot how much time did it take for you to feel better well, I mean, it was such a, it, I would say like 10 years and I was really feeling like I was able to work in a job full time again. And about that's, but that kind of schedule got thrown off a little bit because about seven years in, I thought I'm going to be wanting to go back to work in about a year. I think I feel strong enough to go back to work again in about a year. And then I got pregnant. And so I'm really lucky that I got pregnant at that time. It was hard because I still wasn't quite ready to, you know, feel strong enough that I could work. Um, And then I had to go through pregnancy and childbirth and have a newborn. So that kind of set me back a little bit. But I also am so grateful that I was well enough to be able to have a baby at that time because I've got a beautiful seven-year-old son now. And in that timeline, when did Garden Therapy, your beautiful website, uh, launch? Oh, I started that in 2009. So three years after, so that first couple of years, I really wasn't able to do much. But in 2009, I'd really gotten into gardening and I was, you know, working on it pretty diligently. And I wanted to reach out and meet other gardeners because most people who I knew were either my age and, you know, weren't really that into gardening. They're professionals working in business. And and I, I wanted to just reach out and connect with other people who are growing plants. So I started the blog as a way to sort of show, log some of the things, like like a typical personal blog, logging my garden, logging the projects I was working on. And I started to meet these gardeners from all over the world. And they said, so if this is great that you're doing this, but how did you make that? I want to be able to make it myself. So I started writing out the instructions. And that's how I really fell into my own in garden therapy. Now it's full of 1,200 projects and articles of how to garden in a DIY way. I became that DIY gardener who just loves to teach people how to do it. It's such a go-to resource for all the things you just described and the beauty of the garden and positivity and hope, which rounding back to what you said a little bit ago, isn't that really what a garden brings? And isn't that really what everybody's looking for right now? It's a wonderful website. 
Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I think what I really try to do is make it so easy. So think about, I was so severely disabled that I wasn't able to do much. I lost use of my arms and my legs constantly. I had to make the projects easy, but I wanted them to be easy and high reward. So I have a lot of projects on there that you can do simply with materials that you have. You don't have to do a lot of shopping and they look beautiful. You can have them on Instagram in a few hours. Like it is... <laughs> But yeah. it isn't that the goal. Yeah, but, but, it, but it makes you feel good. I mean, every time I make a planter with a couple of annuals around a candle in the center, and every time I walk by it, I smile. Like, it doesn't matter how many people enjoy the beautiful photo of it on Instagram. It makes me feel happy. And I think there's so much value in not just, you know, the growing food is labor, and it's worth the labor because all those wonderful fresh flavors that you can't buy in a grocery store you get. Same with making, you know, growing things to make your own skincare, but just planting a flower, if that's just where you want to start, it will make you happy. Oh, so <laughs> true. Now, uh, Stephanie, it probably goes without saying, but let's just emphasize it. You are an organic gardener. And could you tell everybody what that means to you? Yeah. So over this, over the time that I was studying gardening, I really didn't, I didn't, like I said, it could have been chemical poisoning. I didn't want to introduce anything into my body that I didn't know of because I didn't know if that was the thing that was making me sick. So Mm -hmm. I went to all organic food, all organic skincare, and all organic gardening. And I really dove into this concept of how does nature grow things? How does nature, because you look at the forest, the forest doesn't need a whole bunch of people in there helping the plants grow. It just grows. The tree leaves fall off and they mulch the soil. They feed, they decompose and feed the soil. The soil organisms all work together so that everything survives and thrives in in one community. And so I really started getting into um, permaculture, which is this concept of not just Um, organic gardening, but creating systems that support themselves. So you can actually step away from a permaculture garden and it will grow itself and thrive without your involvement. So now my garden is a lot less work. It's completely organic. And I, you know, people come over and they say, oh, your garden is so lush. It's so full. You must work so hard. And I'm like, no, really? I just pick a few things here and there. It (laughs) doesn't. I set up the system so that it grows itself so that. Right. I just got out of the way of plants doing the job that they want to do, which is to grow. Oh, I love that. Right. And you're doing uh, that by feeding the soil, not just feeding the plants. So can you tell everybody a little bit about what that means? Yeah. So you said it, compost, compost, compost. I love compost. Oh, I love in your book. I I circled it. (laughs) Hooray for compost. Like I was like, that's, I've known Stephanie for a while, but yeah, this is underlined that we are soulmates. Hooray for compost indeed. (laughs) Well, when I did, I did the Master Gardeners program uh, 11 years ago now in Vancouver and so that was another part of my my um, my education and my connection with other gardeners. Um, Master Gardeners programs, they bring you together to teach you how to become a volunteer educator to help people grow better gardens out in the community. So it's an education position. And I worked a lot with children's gardens. But every, you know, during the program, when you're doing the learning component, they have different topics. And Soil Day was... The day I was so excited about, I felt like (laughs) such a nerd being so excited about soil, but I was bubbling with excitement after soil day because soil science, it's, it's so amazing how much of a difference it makes to have healthy soil. And so I was just talking about doing soil, like a basic soil composition test. And a lot of people don't have this experience with soil that you, um, can get to know, do you have clay soil? Do you have sandy soil? Do you have loam? We want to try to get to that uh, that idea of loam, right? So we want to try to get to um, our soil is made up of sand, silt, and clay. Each is a different size particle. Sand is a bit larger. Silt is a bit smaller than that. And then clay is quite small. And if you've got heavy clay soil, then it can be really hard to grow things because it holds a lot of water and it doesn't have a lot of air, air pockets. If you have heavy sandy soil then water drains through it so quickly that you don't have the um you, you don't have the water retention and plants dry out really quickly you have to water all the time so you want to try to get in that middle ground of having a little bit of sand a little bit of clay and that mixture of silt that gives you loam 
And the way to do that is to add organic matter into your soil. So you don't, you wouldn't add, if you have high clay soil, you wouldn't add sand. Because if you did that, those small particles and big particles would bind together like cement and become mm-hmm. complete, they glue together and become impermeable. But no matter what kind of soil you have, if you add organic matter and turn it in, so organic matter can be compost, it can be green manure, so plants that uh, you plant so that they, you know, like uh, clovers and things like that, that you turn into the soil to help uh, feed it with nutrients and organic matter for the microbes in there to eat and digest and um, or manures. So add, adding those things to your soil can really improve the soil condition. And the plants respond like it's it's so amazing. In a season, you can see a huge difference. When I moved into this current house that I'm in, so I had to leave that first garden that I was working in, but I did complete soil transformation there. What I did here is I came and there's all these beautiful, expensive landscape plants, but they were sick, overgrown, diseased and full of pests Mm. and I thought so most people would look at them and go well there's something wrong with the plants take them all out put in new plants I looked under the hood at the soil and I found that the previous owners had done a bunch of construction on the house and they buried the construction materials in the soil so there was big (gasps) blocks of concrete in there and nails and wood and all this stuff that was making was toxic for the plant they also put a bunch of sand in there And so I dug all the junk out, put in some nice organic matter and have been building the soil, left the plants where they were and the disease went away and they started flowering again and they pests went away because I fed the soil and the plants were now strong enough to be able to thrive in their spots they were already in. I've had a very similar experience here. When we moved in, it was um, almost concrete. And uh, I've joked before with other people describing what my yard looked like. It was like Fred Sanford had decorated it. It was a pile of of metal and there was scrap over here and there was a pile of something else. And then there were motor oil cans and all of this stuff. Oh, yes, yes. I I don't know if I ever shared a picture of, of my yard with you. But yeah, so I started really with the foundation. And you really want to get to the beautiful plants, but if you don't do the soil, right? You're never going to have healthy plants. So hooray to you for explaining that. And also hooray for this wonderful, simple soil test that you describe in your newest fabulous book, Garden Alchemy. It is such a beautiful book. I read it over the the weekend and I enjoyed it. I have post-its and all these pages and I have all these things I want to do. I mean, it's, it's like your home apothecary book where every page I turn, I want to make that, I want to do that. So um, tell everybody a little bit about Garden Alchemy and why the title Alchemy. It's also a very vibrant, beautiful cover. Everyone's going to enjoy it when they have a look at the book. And then when you dive in, you're just going to adore it. It is fantastic. Gives you so much gardening information and wisdom and all these really simple things that you can do from learning about your soil to uh, actual DIY projects. Oh, thank you so much, Kelly. That's so nice of you to say. Um, I'm really, really proud of this book. This takes the um, experience that I have with organic gardening and permaculture, which I've studied permaculture. I've done a number of permaculture design certificates. So again, building these systems to feed the garden as one unit and or support the garden as one unit and then also herbalism so i'm studying plants as medicine and so i took those three concepts and put that into a book of recipes concoctions and elixirs for your garden so it's a cook it's essentially set up like a cookbook where there's recipes throughout the book and you don't have to start at the beginning and try the projects you know just like a cookbook You go through and you read the recipes and you think these are the ones that i want to try these are the ones that i want to work on in my garden So there's over 80 of them in here, plus a whole bunch of things that help lists on all the different kind of mulches that you could use in the garden and where you would use them and why you would use them. Lists of all different kinds of soil amendments and how you use them, how to blend your own dry fertilizers using natural ingredients or how to make weed tea. So how to take those lawn clippings and garden clippings that are nice and healthy and full of nitrogen and brew a tea that you can use to feed your garden. So the the concept behind it was, you know, alchemy is that, so it's sort of shrouded in this, you know, mystery. People think of it as maybe witchcraft, but alchemists of long ago, they, it's, 
they got a bad rap because they were trying to, they had really lofty goals of trying to change metals into gold, um, <laughs> right. get the, you know, reach the fountain of youth. Um, but but your compost, <laughs> compost is garden gold, right? So it's kind of the it same is, thing. It is. It is for sure. I, I mean, they were trying to do these things that were so grandiose that, um, that they weren't able to achieve, that they got pretty much a bad reputation or bad science. On the other hand, their methods were completely something that we should be following. They were solid. They went out and they experimented and observed the natural world and used that to learn how things worked. And that's what I did when I was off work and I was sick and at home. I learned how the world worked by experimenting and observing. And this book, Garden Alchemy, is laid out so that you can start that process in your garden. So you start in the beginning with the soil and mulches chapter, and it has some experiments that you can do with your soil, like the one we talked about with the composition test. And then there's soil pH tests and a couple of other different ways that you just get to know your garden. You can do a soil composition test on different beds, too. So you know, so you have like more of an understanding of how it is separated throughout your property, not just the land that you're gardening in as a whole. So once you have that understanding, then you can go through the book and sort of figure out, okay, what are the things that I want to try to add into my garden to help? And can I start replacing? Do I need to keep buying my own potting mix in a bag for my mm -hmm. containers? Or can I blend my own with ingredients that are pretty easy to find? So I have a potting mix recipe in here that's peat free because I uh, think that peat should be left in the box. And we can use things that are far superior in our potting mixes. For example, peat dries out and it's very acidic. And once it dries out, it turns into this hard puck that's really hard to rehydrate. So a peat-free mix that you can make at home, you make it with compost, coconut core, and then either rice hulls or perlite. So rice hulls are a byproduct of the rice industry and you can buy them at like a U-Brew beer location. Oh, wow. And they, yeah, and they're dirt cheap. And it makes for a great um, peat-free potting mix soil um, amendment. Wow. I didn't know about the rice hulls. I love that idea. Another thing I didn't know about when I was reading the book is that bees like to take baths. I love that project. Could you just give everybody a little snippet about the bee bath and how you do that? And yeah, I, I just thought it's so interesting that they would need that. Yeah. Well, we think about growing our gardens and having all these um, plants available for bees. People, I'm so proud that People are really embracing bees and they've become the sweetheart insect of the world and planting gardens for them, inviting them in, being kind to them. It's all great. They, but they get thirsty. <laughs> bees get really thirsty and they, they are such hard workers. They I mean, work they, so hard. They, they really... deserve a beer maybe. Or... <laughs> <laughs> you watch them and you know, that's the thing. If you see a bee that looks like it's a little bit sick on the ground, it's probably hot and tired and it needs to take a break. And a bee bath is a great way to have little spots of water in your garden that can invite bees in to let them have a drink and they need those drinks to keep hydrated they bring back water to if they're a hive bee they bring back water to the hive it helps them with pollen digestion honey bees use it to produce honey so i mean having a little bee bath in your garden i have a couple of water features in my garden and there's always bees in them but they're bubbling and splashing and the bees get you know a little bit wet and uh -huh. so you can make a really simple bee bath. This is in the wildlife chapter of the book. A really simple bee bath by taking one garden pot and turning it upside down and then taking the tray for that garden pot, so the little ceramic tray or a nice ceramic dish, and setting it on top, then putting a few river stones or some nice decorative rocks in there and filling it up with water just so that it reaches the midway point of the stone. That gives the bees a little landing perch so that they can land on the rocks and they can drink the water and then they can fly off without, you know, getting into a deeper pond or something like that and drowning. They need a perch so that they can drink the water right. from the, the, from the They do a lot, but they don't swim, probably. No, right? they don't. <laughs> <laughs> no. So no bee pools. Don't you just love a great recommendation from a friend? Well, we're delighted to be recommending these companies and their wonderful products to you today. And let them know your friends at DTT sent you.
inevitably with the new year come wellness goals. One very effective and easy to reach goal is to add dose to your wellness regime. Dose is expertly formulated organic wellness shots that support your liver in one delicious drink. Formulated with ingredients clinically shown to support liver health, potent turmeric, milk thistle, and ginger. There's zero sugar and zero calories. Did you know that your liver performs over 500 special functions? Since I learned all that my liver is doing, I started with Dose to support all those vital functions. I take a shot of refreshing Dose two times per week to combat everyday toxins from food, meds, alcohol, and unhealthy air. Since starting with Dose about a month ago, I am definitely feeling an overall improvement in my health. So if you want to give Dose a shot and invest in your health like I have, Dose is offering DTT listeners 15% off your first order, plus an additional 15% off if you subscribe for a monthly delivery. That's 30% off your first order. So go to dosedaily.co slash DTT and use the code DTT. That's dosedaily.co.co slash DTT and use the code DTT. Pesto pork chops over Parmesan polenta. Not that easy to say, but oh, so easy to make with Green Chef. Green Chef is the number one meal kit company for eating well, and we have such a great deal for you. You're going to save $250. Listen on for the details on that. Green Chef makes eating well easy for any lifestyle, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or just looking to eat more balanced meals. You know, we're getting into the busy holiday season, so it's a perfect time to have Green Chef help you out. Let Green Chef take the work out of eating clean this holiday season with their chef-crafted, nutritionist-approved recipes featuring fresh ingredients and nothing artificial. And you know what? You don't have to lose track of your healthy eating habits during the holidays. Every Green Chef customer gets a free, that's right, a free session with their registered dietitians who will walk you through how to make clean eating work for you. So sign up for your free session and start on the road towards better health today. And the deal I want to tell you about, visit greenchef.com slash DTT250 and use the code DTT250 for $250 off your order. So that's greenchef.com slash DTT250 and use the code DTT250 for $250 off your order. Another concept that was in the book that I thought was so interesting and I never would have thought about it is the concept of the sacrificial perennials. <laughs> yes, I always think that's the thing that people, like if I'm doing a talk and I talk about it, they're just going to walk out. They're just like stand up and be like, I'm out of here. I'm not planting plants for the aphids. <laughs> no, but it's so smart. Yeah. And so, I mean, because again, the whole garden, you're considering the entire garden. Yeah, doing this. exactly. When I talk about inviting wildlife to your garden, I'm in, I'm talking about inviting pests and beneficial insects. They're all wildlife. It's not so black and white. It's that one insect is a pest and another insect, one's a good guy and one's a bad guy. Some of them do both. You know, we think about wasps and wasps have, you know, they're really annoying to us when we're eating on our patio and they want to get in there for some of that food. Um, but they do so many good things of keeping pest populations down in the garden because they they, you know, go and they snack on aphids and eat other things out there in the garden. So we want to try to balance the wildlife in our garden so that not one thing is becoming out of control. Now, if your garden is just full of aphids and you're constantly spraying them, you're constantly trying to figure out how to get rid of them, that's way too much work for a permaculture gardener. It's way too much work for me. Instead, I'll take plants that attract aphids and I know that they attract aphids because they have aphids on them and then I'll set them in a part of the garden where I where it's sacrificial if they're trap plants I put them in a place in the garden that's not near my vegetable garden or my prize plants the things that I don't want aphids on and I let the aphid population just bloom over there because they have to get to a certain threshold for the beneficial insects for the for the predatory insects to move in and want to eat them so once they hit that level, then the predatory insects are like, oh, hey, guys, there's aphids over there. We got to go eat some. And they will clean your, once they finish that snack over in the aphid nursery, 
they go through the lettuce and they clean every aphid out of them. So you pull it out of the garden and it's like it never even needs to be washed. There's not one bug to be found. So, yeah, I want them doing the work for me. I don't want to sit there and spray and use the hose and try to fight the aphids. I want to invite the bugs that are going to do it for me for free. That is a brilliant concept. I'm definitely <laughs> going to be to start doing that. Um, okay, so what is the most important thing that our listeners can do for their home gardens? Well, I think the thing that they can do is, like we talked about earlier, is, is work on the soil. But it can seem really daunting. It can seem like I don't even know where to start. How do I even think about starting this? So um, I would suggest starting with just like what I did, just a few minutes a day. Start with just getting your feet wet. Like if you want to start working on the soil, it doesn't have to all be improved in a big weekend project where, you know, you're completely ruin your back and you've dug up everything and you've replaced the soil. But instead, every time you're out pruning the plants, take all the material that it doesn't have disease or doesn't have pests on it, but all that night and, and not weeds and take all that nice gardeny compost and make a weed tea. So take that, um, sorry, not gardening compost, but garden clippings, take it and put it in a five gallon bucket in a pillowcase. Um, and fill that up with water, let it sit in the sun for, for 72 hours, and use that to water the garden. It's going to add some nutrition back in of all those leaves. And then instead of taking those leaves and throwing them in the green bin, put them in your compost bin and start making your own compost. And that uh, compost yeah. over the years is, and you know, you're starting to feed the plants with the clippings, and then you're taking the, the rough material, the fibrous material, composting it, and then feeding the soil wildlife it's the microbes the organisms the the um, the bugs and insects and worms and everything that lives in your soil feeding them so that they're helping release the nutrients to the plant roots so taken in little steps and yep. you know whether it be little bits of time or little sections of your garden you can really change over your entire property into this like well-oiled machine like stephanie's got going on here and of course you're going to be need to be reading uh garden alchemy and you're going to need to subscribe to garden therapy so you can have your hand held th through this entire process because i don't think there is one topic that stephanie hasn't cover covered in a myriad of different posts or in her books so there, all the information is there for you. Um, I have a little information that I need from you, Stephanie. I need your opinion. So I have a compost bin, like one that I turn. Should I add composting worms to that or just let it do its thing? So it's raised off the ground so worms can't get into it, right? Right. So it's in an enclosed bin. It's an enclosed bin. Yeah, a, roll, mm -hmm. a rolling composter. Yes. Yeah, I have a rolling composter and I never put worms in it and it's full of worms. And I have no oh. idea. Yeah, I have no idea how they got in there. What I do, I just did this on the weekend too, is I, I took the compost out and then I left it in the sun so all the worms migrated down. And then uh -huh. I scraped off the top bit of compost, used that, and then put all the worms back in. You um, really know how to party, girlfriend, I have to say. That was <laughs> Memorial Day weekend. She was doing that, everybody. <laughs> yeah. No, I know how to party. I was playing with my worms. But my son said, because he was doing it with me, and he said it was the most fun he's had, like, all, I, I don't know. He said, this is the best day ever. I want to do this every oh, day. Oh, done. You know. That's it. That's, that is <laughs> You, you did it with the right crowd. Yeah. yeah. It's all about with being with the right crowd. Yeah, exactly. So you're, so with the rolling compost bin, I mean, the, that's, I, I think mine is an anomaly. I don't know how the worms got in there, but I keep them in there because they've, they've moved in on their own. Yeah. Um, they, if it's not attached to the ground, then if you put the worms in the rolling compost bin, they will probably not survive if you put it yeah. if you like I somehow got wild worms so I'm lucky <laughs> that they moved in on their well, own maybe you could send me a little envelope full of wild worms <laughs> I don't know if they can, that you can get that across the border Yeah, that Canada. won't get stopped at the border at all. No, a little envelope of worms. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, would, I would probably not purchase anything for that rolling composter and just allow it to do its thing. And just make sure that you've got a really good balance of your compost. So you want to have two-thirds of browns and one-third of greens and air and water. So if it's got enough air and water, so you're 
the reason why you're rolling it is to get air it's to aerate the compost and you know probably gets water from the juicy things that you put in from your kitchen scraps and right. also from rain so i find that those two usually aren't too out of balance um in most systems but what people i think t- can get a little bit um challenged with is browns when you're thinking about your carbon source People think that brown leaves are pure carbon or pure browns, but they are probably two thirds carbon, one third nitrogen, even if they're brown in color. So that brown needs to be paper, straw, you know, shredded newspaper, something like that that's really dry. And if you want to just do a compost with just leaves, leaves are perfect to compost completely on their own because they've got that two thirds to one third and will break down really nicely into nice compost. But yeah, if you want to balance out your compost, making sure that it has enough of that carbon source, enough of that paper or dry goods, then it should, you know, invite enough of the microorganisms, not just worms that break things down. There's all sorts of microorganisms that will do it and other insects. And so, yeah, I mean, I have a separate worm bin. And you see, there's a, a project in here for a worm bin. If you, uh, I do love. I saw I, that. I do love yeah. my worms. <laughs> I know you do. But you don't I... need them for your compost. There are okay. all sorts of other things out there that will co- will help break it down for you. Okay, sounds good. So there may be people that are listening to us that are not organic gardeners, or they're not really sure if they are an organic gardener or not. So what would be a first step if someone wanted to become an organic gardener? Well, I think it comes down to observation um, and, you know, sort of getting, I think it's awareness, being aware of what it is that you're putting in is what you get out. So if you're spraying a bunch of Roundup in your garden or some sort of, you know, massive weed killer because you're killing things, it's indiscriminately killing. So it might be killing the weeds of that plant, but it's also leaving a bunch of things in the soil and it's hurting the soil wildlife. You're going to have to do a lot more work to help repair that land. If you're spending time supporting all, you know, supporting the soil wildlife, supporting the above ground wildlife, helping the plants thrive naturally, then you can walk away and the garden will grow without you. You don't have to fight it. (laughs) Yeah. So just be aware. How much effort are you putting? If you've got a bunch of pests in the garden and they're driving you crazy. So say you've got squash bugs and it's just like, I can never grow squash. Squash bugs are everywhere then think about why are they there? What is the what is the perfect environment that's inviting them? And who eats them? So how can you, instead of you doing all the work, handpicking and getting sprays and trying to get rid of them, how can you invite that creature that wants to eat them for you so you can sit, drink a tea or a glass or a mojito? <laughs> nice, right. Perfect. Um, Well, I would say the first step to becoming an organic gardener is to get a copy of Garden Alchemy. Uh, (laughs) Truly, it it has so much in there and it really is so um, user friendly and understandable and the photos are so helpful. So it's a wonderful book and we're going to have an opportunity for all of you to enter for a chance to win a, a copy of Garden Alchemy, but it is also available on Amazon. I will have the link to the information about the giveaway and how you'll enter in the show notes as well of course if you can't wait which you know I couldn't so (laughs) I have a copy Uh, you can get your copy right now through Amazon or through Stephanie's site so we'll have links to all of that and and everything that Stephanie is up to in the show notes. And I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time today and sharing your story of being healed by the garden. And in turn, gathering all this information together and sharing it all with everyone so we can all be happier and healthier through gardening. I really appreciate Stephanie. I have been an avid fan of yours since we met uh, many years ago. And I continue every time you put something out, it's just better than the thing before. Oh, thank you so much, Kelly. You know, that's so nice that you're giving away a copy of Garden Alchemy to the listeners. And um, I wanted to, it just made me think, and I hope you don't mind. I also have a webinar that I've done for Garden Alchemy. So I was in the middle of my book tour for Garden Alchemy. And because of COVID, the garden Mm. shows got shut down. So I was at the Northwest Flower and Garden Show. I got home. It's just about to get on a plane to go to Canada Blooms and had to cancel my free talks there. Um, So what I did is I put Garden Alchemy, the webinar online, and I would 
And I, so I, I would love for your listeners to come and join the webinar as well. But oh, I would love to give away a copy of the webinar along with the book as oh. well. So they get, uh, yeah, they get the online learning plus the, plus the, the textbook. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. So you, um, we'll discuss how we can do that and we'll put all that information in the show notes. How's that? Oh yeah, that's great. Perfect. Oh my gosh. That is such a delight. What a great surprise. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to check out the webinar too. Oh, great. So, yes. I'll, I'll make sure you, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you the details so that you can get into it as well. Wonderful. And thanks so much. It was really so much fun to talk to you today. I always enjoy it so much. Anybody that is, gets that excited about soil is my kind of gal. <laughs> <laughs> I know we definitely have, we definitely have a bond in there in compost and soil. <laughs> thanks, Stephanie. Thank you, Kelly. Bye. Bye. That was so much fun speaking with Stephanie. I love her passion for gardening and her creativity. Well, are you ready for the hot topic sure. for today? All right. This is from House Beautiful, and it is the app Primer. Basically, the title says, This app lets you virtually test drive wallpaper and tiling from popular design brands in your home. So it's an app where you can try out products virtually in your home and you know you and I've talked about this capability that was coming to iPhones but this is kind of an exciting thing to uh, see what the products will look like in your home yeah I'm still not 100% on board with these <laughs> I, I think it's a great idea in conceptually but I don't think the technology has caught up with the concept and if mm -hmm. you read the article which is you know it's an interesting article for sure but there's only five brands that you can yes. test drive in your own home and you know at the end of the day it's not really in your own home it's on your little phone so i don't know True. you know check it out read the article hey if there's a brand that's listed that is a brand you're interested in it's definitely another way that you can make important decisions for your home decor and important things like tile and wallpaper and all of that so you know i wouldn't say ignore it keep your eye on this technology at some point it's going to get good yes that's true and i think that i had didn't try i have not tried this one so i you know but it may be more helpful with the products but i agree when you have such a limited selection of stores that you can work with then they really it's not uh that helpful if you have to pull from stores that maybe you wouldn't normally shop from so you can't just get any product and put it in virtually in your house crushes my crush is very in tune with today's guest. It's my composter. I got a new rolling composter. That's So that's a bin style. Uh, so it's an enclosed bin. It's off the ground. Kind of picture it kind of like a... Um, almost like an old timey bingo roller, but you know, it's not a cage. It's completely enclosed, but it's on a stand and it rolls around and it has a little pin that holds it in place when you want to hold the tumbler in place. So it could be a uh, referred to as a bin composter, a tumbler composter, but that type is great if you are short on space or you're in more of an urban area, you have neighbors that are close by, you don't have an area in the you know, the far reaches of your yard where you can just do a pile or you don't have an area where you can enclose it with wood and kind of leave it open. So I'm, I have had different compost setups in the past uh, but this is the first time I'm trying the bin um, so I can't tell you how it's turning out because I'm just kind of loading it up and I'm paying very close attention to my ratios of carbons and nitrogen so my browns and my greens and got my fingers crossed and my composter tumbling so in maybe three months or a little bit longer I should have some garden gold uh, are you going to be growing any anything to eat any edibles or is this all well yeah in the raised beds we have veggies going already yeah so that they're, they're uh we i didn't really get too much in the ground in the spring because other than seeds the nurseries were closed in the earlier spring so we're just concentrating now on the summer veggies so we've got tomatoes and cucumbers and squash and pole beans and a couple of and lots of herbs going on Oh, wow. Oh, I am so impressed. Okay. So you beat me on that, even though my bread's pretty darn good. But <laughs> Your bread is pretty darn good. I, I can only imagine it is. If we could just so bring them crush? together. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. BritBox just keeps getting better. The new 
Archie is amazing. And it's not the comics. It's about Cary Grant. Archie is the brand new limited series starring Jason Isaacs as Archie Leach, the man who became Cary Grant. From the award-winning screenwriter of Philomena, Archie tells Grant's born in Britain, made in Hollywood story, the dramatic grit to glamour transformation that led him to become one of the most famous people in the world. You are going to absolutely love the acting, but also the styling, the outfits, the scenery. It's the first time his story has been told in collaboration with his daughter, Jennifer Grant, and ex-wife, Diane Cannon. The performances from Jason Isaacs and the rest of the cast are amazing. And it's only available on BritBox. So sign up for BritBox today to stream Archie and other fan favorites from any device. And we have a special limited time offer for our U.S. and Canadian listeners. Get 50% off. Yes, that's 50% off your first month when you sign up for a monthly plan. But only if you go to BritBox.com and use our promotion code DTT at checkout. You're going to love Archie. So head over right now and get 50% off your first month of BritBox. Use the promotion code DTT at BritBox.com. Green Chef is a delicious delight any time of year, but especially during the holidays. What a wonderful vision to behold of the Green Chef boxes on your doorstep. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well. And it makes eating well so easy with plans to fit every lifestyle, whether you're keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or just looking to eat a more balanced diet. So let Green Chef take the work out of eating clean this holiday season. And if you've got guests coming, shop Green Bundles. They're now available at the Green Market. It's your one-stop shop for nutritious grab-and-go breakfasts, including vegan options, brunch kits, wholesome lunches, ready-to-eat snacks, veggie sides, and more. You can feel your best this December and do your best with Green Chef because they offset 100% of the delivery emissions as well as 100% of the plastic in every box. Go to greenchef.com slash 60DTT and use the code 60DTT and get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. Greenchef.com slash 60DTT. And use the code 6060DTT to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. My crush is uh, something just to kind of bring a smile to your face and something that's very relaxing. I mean, are you in for something just very peaceful and relaxing? So this is the YouTube channel for the Biltmore Estate I just discovered they have a channel. So it's short little videos, but one, for example, is the drive from the gates of Biltmore all the way back to the house, and it's the most relaxing, peaceful drive. And it's quite a, I I don't know, several miles, I want to say, up to the house. So it's a beautiful drive, and then they have some of the gardens there. You would enjoy that, I think. Uh, So they have a lot of, they're just very short videos, maybe two minutes, five minutes, but it's kind of a fun thing. Um, Okay, so our question today is from Gia R., Gia wants to know, how much do we change our decor for summer? Oh, (laughs) okay. All right. Uh, The truth? (laughs) Well, we're all about the truth here. (laughs) Well, as you know, Kelly, I don't really do a lot of changing. So I really like just change out a little bit. I'll change out maybe a little bit with the vignettes, make sure I don't have any kind of furry, warm, you know, the warm feeling pillows for the summer. Uh, so I might do some changes with the throws and the pillows and, and maybe some with my vignettes, but but not a lot. So there you have it. How about you, Kelly? Yeah, I mean, Anita and I both live where it's mostly warm for most of the year. And occasionally, you know, we get a rainy season here and maybe it dips down a little bit. And of course, for the Christmas holidays and whatnot, I do some decorating. But I, it, I don't think that there's a real bright line between the seasons for me necessarily either in my house overall. Yeah, small vignettes. There's always something by my front door and that I might give a nod to the seasons. Um, and then furry pillows 
pillows. Yeah, I take the covers off and I'll change out the pillow covers. And I do a little bit more on my porch too um, because that's the first thing that people are seeing. So I might just change up the color, maybe add a pop color and make it feel a little bit lighter and brighter for the summertime. But not a lot of really like screaming at me. I got to pull out the surfboard or everything is raffia. It doesn't, it doesn't really work with my house in general. I've tried to keep it decorated in a way where it can be not only timeless, but seasonless, I guess, to a certain extent. And I also find, Gia, that, you know, you need a lot of storage if you're going to be swapping things out all the time, even if it's a pillow. So that's why I'm always getting nice inserts and then changing the covers because then you can just fold them up into a little square and put them someplace or in uh, in a Ziploc bag or something and store them away till the next season. So I don't know what you're thinking about doing in your house, but I would have a couple of spots, like what I like to call my um, like decor hotspots that you change out. Maybe that's the Uh, center of your dining room table. Maybe that's your entryway or on your coffee table, or there's a little place in your kitchen maybe where you'll do something for the seasons or change out fresh flowers or put a little plant or something like that. Do our favorite easy summer decor is a big bowl of lemons. Uh, You know, something simple uh, where it's either edible or it's floral and then you can compost the floor or the flowers after they pass away or it's a plant or something like that. Uh, also to avoid having to store these things away and then dragging them in and dragging them out. So I think it can be done in a really easy, simple, organic way and still give you the feel that, you know, the season has changed. Well, I think you really hit on a key point there, Kelly, and that is where do you store all this stuff that's out of season? And for so many of us that have cleaned out our closets, decluttered, I love the way my house is now where I can find everything in the closets. If And if I was changing out a lot of stuff, I would no longer be able to find things in my closet. I would have them overstuffed. And uh, so for me, that that's really an issue. And I think you make a very good point. So you have to kind of count the cost, as they say. Is it? Is, are you willing to uh, provide all this storage space dedicated just to seasonal decor if you're going to change that out a lot? So, And for a lot of people, I think they're going to say no because they just don't have a lot of space. But if you have a lot of closets you're not using, then, you know, that might be uh, the way to go for you. Yeah. So hopefully that helps, uh, Gia. And if you had anything specific that you wanted to follow up with us, please do via email. And certainly that goes to anyone. We love getting your questions and or just your emails to say hi and letting us know that you're enjoying the show. We absolutely love getting those. We sure do. And remember, we're here to inspire you to create a beautiful home. Until next time. I want to remind you that we are available for design consults. We take on your design dilemmas, questions, renovations, any project you want to talk about, any room, any space. We are here for you. And we really do enjoy doing these. And I think we've helped people a lot. So if you want to sign up for a consult, head to the link in the show notes. It's decoratingtipsandtricks.com slash consult. We hope to talk to you soon.